130,000 people are moved, many of whom have already been dangerously contaminated. A 300,000 hectare area straggling the Ukraine and Belarusia is abruptly evacuated and isolated from the rest of the world. A vast region uprooted, an entire culture ripped from its land. A world wiped out in a few days' time by an invisible enemy. It was worse than the war. Here you couldn't see the enemy. In a war, you see the cannons, the machine guns, the tanks. Here, you see nothing. The radiation is everywhere. It goes right through you. It gets into you, and you only start feeling the effects later, sometimes years later. It's terrifying. Meanwhile, the radioactive cloud continues to drift over Europe. It floats over Bavaria and northern Italy. Radioactive cesium-137 and iodine-131 rain down on the south of France and Corsica. Crops and pastures are seriously contaminated. While French authorities deny its presence, the cloud reaches Great Britain and spreads into Greece. In Chernobyl, the level of radioactivity continues to climb. 6,000 tons of sand and boric acid have filled the hole. But underneath this gigantic plug, the white-hot magma continues to smolder. Ten days after the disaster, Gorbachev personally invites Hans Blix, director of the powerful International Atomic Energy Agency, to visit the site. He is the first expert and the first Westerner to visit Chernobyl. What can you say on this occasion? Well, we have seen the site from the air. And we have seen that a little smoke is still coming up from the damaged plant. There was a good deal of talk about the risk of a second explosion. And I remember that when we were in Moscow, actually, we had a friend, a relative of one of my experts, uh, phoned him and said, well, you know, we hear rumors that a second reactor might also explode. At the bottom of the reactor, 195 tons of nuclear fuel are still burning, giving off incredible heat that is gradually melting the sand. On the surface of the plug, cracks begin to appear. Once we plugged up the hole, the temperature started to rise. We were afraid because it could have caused another explosion. It was terrifying. Scientists came to take readings. They were very worried. They were afraid the critical temperature would be reached and it would set off a second explosion. That would have been a terrible tragedy. The cement slab below the reactor core is heating up and in danger of cracking. The magma is threatening to seep through. The water the firemen poured during the first hours of the disaster has pooled below the slab. If the radioactive magma makes contact with the water, it could set off a second explosion even more devastating than the first. The country's top experts are called into action. Vasily Nesterenko was one of them. At the time, he was working on improving the Soviet Union's intercontinental nuclear missiles. If the heat managed to crack the cement slab, only 1,400 kilograms of uranium and graphite mixture would have needed to hit the water to set off a new explosion. The ensuing chain reaction could set off an explosion comparable to a gigantic atomic bomb. 
Our experts studied the possibility and concluded that the explosion would have had a force of three to five megatons. Minsk, which is 320 kilometers from Chernobyl, would have been razed and Europe rendered uninhabitable. We had to stop the process. If it continued, it would have been an enormous disaster, an enormous nuclear disaster. This second explosion would have been accompanied by a terrible shock wave and a massive rise in radioactivity that would have claimed thousands of lives in a matter of hours. Thank God it didn't happen. There were trains with over a thousand cars in Minsk, Gomel and Kiev, ready to evacuate the population. The situation is critical. In Moscow, the State Commission decrees two emergency measures. First, send in a battalion of firemen to drain the water from under the reactor. They will later be declared national heroes, but will suffer from radiation sickness the rest of their lives. Second, seal the breach more effectively to bring the temperature down once and for all. In two days, General Antochkin's men will drop 2,400 tons of lead into the reactor. When we started dumping lead in, the temperature went down right away. It absorbed well and sealed the hole as it melted, so there was less radiation. But some of this lead melts when it hits the blaze and vaporizes into the atmosphere. Twenty years later, traces of it can be found in the sick children of Chernobyl. It's highly criticized today, but given the situation, there was no better solution. And all the people, military or civilians, Officers or not, worked selflessly. I participated in this first stage, and I can tell you, it had to be done. It was heroism. During this operation, 600 pilots are fatally contaminated with radiation. All of them will die but their efforts only by a few days. Although it has been covered over, the fire still isn't out. Flying over in helicopters isn't solving the problem. They need to get closer, go down into the breach. But how? With the imminent threat of a second explosion still looming, the makeshift measures continue. The blueprints of the plant reveal that the active zone can be approached through the cable and pipe tunnels built out of thick cement. A delegation of technicians from the Kirchhoff Institute venture into the labyrinth. It's tough going. Parts of the tunnels have collapsed in the explosion. They pierce through the shell of the fourth reactor with a blowtorch and stick their radioactivity detectors and thermometers in, along with cameras. The result is terrifying. The radiation levels are astronomical and their worst fears are confirmed. The white-hot magma has cracked the cement slab and seeped into the empty basin. It is now threatening to sink even further. There was a 5 to 10 percent risk of explosion. We drained the water from under the reactor, but something absolutely had to be done. Something had to be put underneath the reactor to keep the magma from seeping down. Something had to keep it from falling in. Nothing is stopping the magma from seeping even deeper into the sandy subsoil. And beneath